everybody. Dragon Movie Guy here. Thank you for tuning in. This is my baseball movie ranking in honor of baseball season starting. It's always fun to talk about baseball movies. I googled how many baseball movies are there, and there are hundreds. 1898, there is a baseball short. There's a proper baseball movie, 1911-ish. So we've been having baseball movies for over a hundred years at this point. Joining me to talk about baseball movies is a man who is a gigantic sports fan. He is also the host of his own podcast, very successful, the Fat Fish Podcast with his co-host, Greg Grunberg. His name is Eric Snyder, but you can call him Fish. He is the man about town who knows just about everybody. He has a story for every situation. He's been, he's an LA native. He's been in Las Vegas for 40 plus years. He is a Raiders reporter. Please welcome Eric Snyder, fish of the Fat Fish podcast. Brad Grunberg is his co-host. He talks about everything under the, under the sun, politics, movies, music, entertainment, pop culture. He can talk about everything. Please welcome my guest, Fish. Fish, welcome to the Dragon Movie Guy podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm a big fan of you. Uh, I follow you religiously to get critiques of my movies. I think I've disagreed with you one time, and that was on Elvis, but it, pretty much you're spot on. Uh, it, it's, it's an honor to be with you. Thank you for coming on, and uh, thank you for talking baseball movies with me. Um, I, I respect your opinion as as a, as a human being and as a movie fan, and uh, and a sports fan across the board, so um, uh, it's 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 good discussions uh, across the board, and uh, we don't have to agree on everything, but uh, I think we agree most of the t- most of the t- most of the time on most subjects, especially movies and and, and sports. So uh, let's start. We're we're talking baseball movies today. Um, general thoughts on baseball and movies: two pieces of Americana, two things born in America. USA, USA, USA. <laughs> some some of your thoughts on baseball movies, and uh, do you do you like this category of movies, this genre of movies? That's almost a subgenre in and of themselves, amongst other sports movies. Yeah, I'm a purist. I mean, I, I remember when baseball in the '70s had equal the ratings of the NFL and NBA, and even the '80s. And you see, I'm wearing my baseball shirt. This is kind of a warm up shirt you use when you go out and play pickle that you see the guys wear before they put their uniforms on. I do like baseball movies. I like the themes of baseball movies. A lot of them, the backstory is love stories. And, you know, I have a, I have a top nine list. And some, some of your listeners and viewers might not know what they are, but they meant a lot to me. And some people will know. And that's the whole point of these lists, because they, they're, uh, they, you know, they reflect us as viewers and fans. And... There are some, uh, you didn't want to see my list to get a fresh reaction, but uh, some of these movies are the same. Some of them are not um, going along. But uh, basically the idea I had was to do a countdown. So basically go do two at a time, doing nine and eight, nine and eight, then seven and six and seven and six. Do about two minutes-ish on each film uh, from the presenter. And then a little brief discussion totaling about, you know, four or five minutes each. Loose loose structure, but just as a structure, uh, still nonetheless, too. That we can throw away at any time that we want, but uh, I don't want to take all of your afternoon. So <laughs> so I figure we could start with, uh, you're the guest, so I'm going to give you the first uh, term, uh, the first time up. So I figure we'll start with your number nine. And okay. we can start with your number nine. And tell me about... Bull Durham, or Bull Durham, as as everyone always says. Ron Shelton, great writer. And um, I have Kevin Costner in two of my nine films, and, and, and they both took place in the 80s. Bull Durham was cutting edge because it follows the minor leagues. His character's name is Crash Davis, and he's there to mentor this kid named Meat, played by Tim Robbins. Is probably Tim Robbins uh you know cutting film i mean we remember him from shawshank redemption which came out a few years later and it's really uh, a story about him mentoring him it's about susan sarandon that plays a school teacher in 
that small North Carolina community. And she always has a guy she sleeps with and she mentors them to kind of make them mature. And it's Tim Robbins character, but secretly Kevin Costner's in love with her. And it just goes through that basic love story. Yeah. It's a, it's a great love triangle. It is, uh, it is the love triangle that we often see in films of it, of lots of different genres, but it's, it's the, the two guys, the one woman, and her having to choose between the two. It, it, yeah, this is a great film. This came out when I was 13 years old, I believe, and uh, it was my first exposure to Tim Robbins, who, of course, we know now also was in Top Gun in a very small role a year or two earlier. But, but Bull Durham, yeah, it's a, it's a great film. What about Bull Durham stands out to you uh, the most? The dialogue. It was great dialogue. There was great meters to the film. The arc was great for people in, in, in the industry. And the ending. The ending, I'm not going to get away. Some people, the young, your younger viewers haven't seen it yet, but it moved along. You know, Ron Shelton is really good at, uh, at giving, throwing different types of twists in films. And, and some of the, the players that were, were part of the, the, the crew of the Durham Bulls, Danny Gans, who was a huge comedian here in Las Vegas, was one, rest in peace, he died. But he's, he's part of the, uh, you know, the, the cast of Durham Bulls. And what was the guy's name, Brian, that played the manager? Um, he was also in Raising oh. Arizona, fantastic. The acting was great. Yeah, I'd have to uh, look that up. I actually have it. I have IMDb up on another page. Yeah. Um, terrific. Robert Wool played this. Yeah, there's a scene in the movie where you know when you go, when you go to the mound and the, to talk to the pitcher, and Robert Wool plays the 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 assistant manager, and all I'm talking about is what they're going to get the guy for his wedding. Well, let's get candlesticks. Let's get where's he registered at? It was something you never thought about. That's a Ron Shelton's way of taking a situation because you, know, you always wondered watching a baseball game. What they talk about when when a coach goes to the mound. You know, and this this had a whole different angle to it. I love that scene. Yeah, what whatever happened to Robert Wool's career? He was huge. He was huge in this movie, and he was huge in their first Batman movie, and uh, kind of dissipated a little bit from there. But he's still around. Had a good run, good run, Brian on um, Dragon Movie Guy. You want to be called Brian or Dragon Movie Guy? Would you want to be by your moniker or your name? Uh, either or, drag. You know, I like Dragon Movie Guy, man. That that's you. That works that, for me. That's, it's... Your, that's your alter ego right now. How about Arliss on HBO at a nice run? Remember, I don't know if you watched that. He was great as a sports agent. So he, he pops up here and there. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, about Good Morning Vietnam. He was great in that. Yes. He a role. So he, he still works. He still produces. But he, he kind of stole the movie. Sometimes people steal a movie. And he has some great lines and great dialogue in, in uh, Bull Durham. And Arliss was a great star vehicle for Robert Wool. Uh, let's, uh, let's move on to number your number eight movie. Um, tell me a little bit about 1984's The Natural. Yeah, what a what a iconic film about a young prodigy that from Nebraska that's that it, it's it's the up and coming star, and he's wooed to the major leagues, and he gets detoured. I don't want to. You want me to give away the film's plot, or you want me? Because I, I I want people to watch these movies. But something happens to him that detours his career for 16 years, and he ends up um, back in the majors. But he's a but he's a 37 year old. We think has been, but he has a lot left in the tank. Robert Redford is phenomenal in this. What I didn't know is that he had to learn a lot about playing baseball. You know, when you watch some of these baseball films, you think they're natural athletes. I have a film coming up at number five that I'll tell you about. A lot of guys need to be trained in playing baseball. Um, he had to learn the swing, the stance, but the way it was shot, the black and white, it takes place, the, the film takes place probably early 40s. You saw the film, right, Dragon Movie Guy? Yeah, yeah, I've seen I've seen The Natural. It is on my list as well. Uh, yeah, great, great example of Robert Redford as a leading, leading man and classic uh, Hollywood storytelling and cinema. Um uh, yeah, I, I feel free, feel free, by the way, to do some spoilers if you want. This is if anyone's watching a video online about a baseball movie that happened 30 plus years ago, my 
my guess is that they don't care as much about uh, spoilers for a 40 year old movie, 35 year old movie. Um, and that, you know, they just love baseball. And, and honestly, if someone was spoiled by the time we're, we're, you're talking about nine movies, I'm talking about nine movies. By the time they actually go to watch the movie, they probably forgot what the spoiler was in the first place. So feel free, feel free I'll, to I'll, spoil away. I'll spoil away. <laughs> Barbara Hershey, tremendous actress, plays a Black Dahlia character who is, is known for killing people that are famous, and she shoots this guy. She shoots him in a hotel room. He thinks he's getting laid, and she shoots him. And then it fast forwards to 16 years later. Uh, Wilford Brimley plays the manager of the New York Knights. You know, it's, it's, it's looks. I don't Quaker like Oats and the Diabetes. The, the yeah. Quaker Oats and the Diabetes. Yeah. Well, Love I, Wilford I, Brimley. Yeah, I remember him in Cocoon. I mean, that was, that to me, that was his coming out film in 1980. Again, 1984, Ron, Ron Howard's coming out to uh, come to Jesus moment. But we could talk about those films all you want. That, his, his character, the way the interaction between Wilford Brimley, the chemistry between him and Redford was terrific because Brimley never believed in the guy. And he, this kid just stuck, you know, Robert Redford stuck by his, you know, that, hey, I, I, I could still play this game. And his heart and his determination Glenn Close plays his his uh, childhood sweetheart. She has a nice role in the film. He finds out he has a kid by Glenn Close. You could t- you could tell how it ends, and it's it's a storybook ending. I mean, I've always had a crush on Kim Basinger from Nine and a Half Weeks. She she's a female lead in this that has a crush on him. Who's the guy that I was in the Night Stalker? Darren McGavin. Remember Darren McGavin's in the oh, film? Oh God, yeah. They he was always- he was he was the dad in a Christmas story. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's a big gambler, so they're gambling against the Knights, making the playoffs. They're a bad baseball team. It's Major League Baseball. It's you know the the movie shot in the old Buffalo War Memorial Stadium, so they had that stadium. That's Buff, old Buffalo War Memorial Stadium was a big minor league park in Buffalo, great sports city. The Bills and the Sabers, they're big in the minor league baseball. They eventually nowadays they should get a major league team. But um, it, it just the, the cinematography, I'll ask you because you're the movie guru. I thought it was brilliant. Yeah, and the, the visuals in The Natural are classic Hollywood magic. Uh, shot on film, which, of course, in 1984, there wasn't digital yet. And thank God there wasn't digital back in 1984 because si- film, lo- film looks better. Digital isn't at the point yet where digital looks as good as film. And there's just... There's a magic, there's this, the Hollywood magic, the celluloid quality to film, and film in this case shines when you're talking about Robert Redford and baseball and classic, beautiful, hard, Hollywood leading ladies, Barbara Hershey and, and Glenn Close back in the day. This is, uh, yeah, it, the visuals in this, and I'm putting up there too, Wilfred Brimley's mustache, because... Wilford Brimley in real life was actually a Navy, uh, an actual Navy SEAL. So the fact that he is, he is the, cla- everyone's classic uncle from the 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s. He is the uncle who's surly with the mustache, but he has the gravitas to pull it off and he's not a mean person. It's just, he's the guy that doesn't put up with any guff, you know, that, that word guff that wouldn't be, that no one uses nowadays, but Wilford Brimley is the guy that, Never puts up with any guff. So, yeah, Wilford Brimley is, is one of all my other favorite parts of The Natural. <laughs> uh, let's, let's go over to my list, and we'll kick off my list with number nine. This is a movie that um, I saw 20, you know, 20, 25 years ago when it, when it first came out, 19, 1993, which I guess technically is 30 years ago. Gosh, I'm old. Uh <laughs> This is a this is the Sandlot. This is mostly a bunch of unknown kid actors, uh, except Patrick Renna has the line of the film. You're killing me, Smalls. We're talking, of course, about 1993's The Sandlot. I just rewatched this last night. This is the second film on my list that has uh, that has James Earl Jones, and of course, James Earl Jones, one of the classic all time baseball movie appearances. This one not as classic, but anytime you can have James Earl Jones. And that baritone voice appearing in a baseball movie. James Earl Jones is one of the classic American treasures. But this also is, um, oddly, if you look at the Wikipedia page for The Sandlot, 
even though the film takes place in 1962 and the movie takes place is comes out in 1993 there is an actual baseball connection to an actual baseball player but one who was in the major leagues from 1997 to 2003 named Benny Agbayani who in the film is called Benjamin Franklin Rodriguez, I believe. Mm-hmm. So he's Benny and Benny. I don't know how they would do a, tell the have a feature film about a guy who wouldn't make the majors until five or six years after the film comes out. Uh, but that's also an interesting little factoid about this film. Um, classic American tale of growing up, being the new kid on the block, dealing with uh, a stepfather, all of the nervousness issues kind of feels similar to a Christmas story in many ways. Um, you get that, that voice, so that voiceover narration and just the innocence of childhood and wanting to play ball with your friends for all those reasons. The Sandlot is number nine on my list. Yeah. What are your or, thoughts on the Sandlot? I, I lived it. I, that, 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 I, a matter of fact, when they shot that film in LA, it's a great scene in that movie. Remember, my favorite character was Quince, the kid with the glasses, and he fakes drowning in that pool. I swam in that pool. That's at the Pan Pacific Pool in L.A. He, he, he fakes drowning, and the beautiful lifeguard, Wendy Peppercorn, gives, gives him mouth-to-mouth, and he steals a kiss. And that look, when he looks at that fence, and she kind of pulls her glasses off and winks at him, and he gets all excited. That's the, that was the innocence of the youth. And, of course, you talked about, you know, it's a kid that is trying to warm up to his stepdad, played by Dennis Leary. Karen Allen, famous actress, played the mom. What a, what a heartwarming film about a bunch of kids that love baseball. Growing up in California like I did, the weather's always great. July 4th, and the, and the, 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 the fireworks are going on, and they're, and they're using the fireworks to go play baseball, light up the sky. Shot wonderfully. That's what I, that's what I took from the film. Yeah, and, and just the, the point of view of being told sort of like the Christmas story where the filmmaking is purposely imperfect, where they're, they're evoking the, the memory of youth. So when they have, when they have the beast or the monster from next door stealing all these balls, they're, they're very clearly some, you know, some grip with a big uh, hand thing coming across the screen, but that's how you remember things when you're eight, nine, 10 years old. So it, it actually kind of adds to the charm of the storytelling and the, the purposeness of the filmmaking, I think, as well, too. So, yeah, I, I love The Sandlot. It is, um, it is, it's one that I hadn't watched uh, for a while, so I, that's why I watched it last night, and it's a lot fresher in my mind than a lot of films on this list. But, uh, yeah, The Sandlot is uh, an all-time classic. and just It's a ton of fun, and it's, it's a truly innocent film where there are no bad people, and you can just put it on, Watch it. It's safe for kids. It's family friendly. It is. Uh, it is great Americana. Great filmmaking across the board. Um, moving on to my number eight movie. Uh, this one is starring Brad Pitt. It has an Oscar nomination in it. It is about general managing. It is about making phone calls. It is about everything except playing baseball. It is about meetings. It's it's theoretically the least interesting part about baseball, but one of the most important parts about baseball in terms of player development, player acquisition. All of that sounds incredible boring, but in, in the hands of the filmmakers in this case, and Brad Pitt as Billy Bean, who is the real-life then and now general manager of the Oakland, potentially Las Vegas Athletics A's, Billy Bean. So uh, I... Uh, this is a film that I didn't know if I would like it when it first came out. It was, it kind of, it follows the A's as they try and compete financially with teams like the New York Yankees. The A's have never been able to compete financially with the bigger markets like LA and New York. So they've had to figure out other ways to try and win. And in this case, we see Jonah Hill come into the picture to try and use sabermetrics or math to try and figure out the most economic way to compete realistically as a baseball team with the Yankees and, and Dodgers and other teams that can pay a lot more money to baseball players. So uh, I, I love the character work in this film. It's not all just math and backroom deals. It's a lot of good character work, too. You see Brad Pitt's journey as Billy Bean. All of this put together 
with a surprising Oscar nomination for a sports film, which you really don't see very often. All of that is why Moneyball is my number eight film on this list. Uh, what are your thoughts on Moneyball? Well, you know, I'm I'm an Oakland guy in L.A., but I, I I love the story. I love that. I like a. I, I'm one of these guys who looks at a film and say, "Wow, that was him." The guy who played Mac, uh, Mark Haddenberg, who had a huge home run in a 20 game winning streak, is Chris Pratt, yeah. who became this huge Jurassic Park uh, franchise, and 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 it's an overall good guy. So you saw a lot of guys in that film uh, that 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 played roles again, like I talked about Danny Gans. Uh, in Bull Durham that went on to big careers after that. Um, my favorite scene in that movie is when Bill, when Brad Pitt's character, the, the, the A's are losing, and they walk, walks in the locker room, and Jason Giambi's character, or well, Jason Giambi, they're all going crazy and laughing, and he takes he takes the bats and he throws them down, and he goes, you know what the effing sound of losing is? And it's quiet. Because that's what you should sound like. Because you know, they're all excited about we are losing and they were they were they were you know they love they're losing games and they're they're partying in the locker room i love that i like everything i love billy bean brad pitt's portrayal of a guy that battled the system the old school of scouts and it's the first film that talked about what what we use nowadays in the nfl analytics Joni hill was an analytics guy don't you agree dragon movie guy and that showed you and they found guys like Mark Haddenberg's, uh, Chris Pratt's character, and say, hey, this guy could hit, this guy is a great, this is what Jonah Hill, Jonah Hill did that really sold me on the film, is he said, look at this guy, what he does when he hits, when it's a two and one pitch, you know, he takes it, he takes it to a full count, or he makes contact, and that's why they were successful. Yeah, and, and also, it's, it's one of those things, too, where Brad Pitt, the movie star, with his movie star looks actually does reflect Billy Bean and how good looking Billy Bean is in real life, especially when he was uh, coming out of high school, coming out of college and being considered to be drafted because a little bit of a spoiler here, but Billy Bean was actually a first round draft pick back in the day. Everyone loved him because he's the good looking guy and who doesn't love the big, strong, good looking guy who's the first round draft pick and Billy Bean washed out and didn't, you know, didn't have the kind of career that I think all the scouts uh, using traditional scouting methods used. And one of those was how good looking he is. Oh my God, he looks like Brad Pitt. He, 20 years before anyone knows who Brad Pitt is. So he must be a first round draft pick. I love that, that, that Billy Bean actually used that real life experience that he went through that worked to his advantage as a kid coming up. And that affects, that informs and in, impacts his decisions that he makes as a general manager 25, 30 years later. It showed the humbleness of the guy. The guy drove a truck and we're good. You said spoils at the end of the film, the Red Sox offer him 12, John Henry uh, played by, Oh God, Arliss. What's his name? Who's great. Arliss Howard, you know? Oh yeah. Robert Wool. Yeah. And who's married to um, Deborah Winker. Here we go. Name dropping here on the dragon movie guys, baseball show. Um, yeah. Well, he wasn't Robert Wool. John Henry offers him $12 million a year and he turns it down. Rumor has it, you know, I used to work for the Raiders and, and, and for AOL back in 98 to 2002. Billy Bean was so good at what he did. There are huge rumors that I could verify that Al Davis made a move to bring him into the Raider organization because if you're that good, then why not? You know, you could, you could do this for football also. And that's what it showed. And it showed what kind of good guy he was. And again, he was so humble. Loved his daughter. His daughter, by the way, I can't think of the actress's name, but she had a nice little role in Ray Donovan as a daughter. So, and then, oh, by the way, his wife in the film was Robin Wright. Oh, you know, so yeah. Jenny. She had a small role, but the, 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 I love films like that. I don't, you could tell me who wrote and directed it, but uh, films like that that attract stars to do five lines means that the script is really good. That's why I've always thought you can have more conjecture on that. Yeah, if you can, if you, if, you know, I'm sure Hollywood, like anything else, is, is, it's big business and everyone kind of knows each other. So anytime you can get, um, you can get stars to get other stars to, to come in, do a day of shooting and do a favor for their friend, it's usually a good sign, uh, for the film, or oftentimes can be a good sign for the film. And Robin Wright coming in and doing that, uh, that probably, what, what probably was a one day shoot 
for Moneyball. Yeah, another example of of doing a favor, but also yeah, probably uh, a good a reading a script and going, wow, this is actually a pretty good uh, script to read. Uh, let's move on to your number seven. Your number seven. I stole the thunder a little bit, but your number seven. I made my list independently, by the way. I didn't even look at your list until I made my list. Your number seven is the Sandlot. And and I'll and I'll just I'll just put a, a, a addendum to what I said is that you watched that took place in sixty two. Well, I was two years old, but I, I I was a kid. I was eight years old, nineteen sixty eight, and that's what you did. There's no phones back then. You you I, Brian, you're a young guy, so you grew up with the phone generation. You went out and you played ball. And my favorite, one of my other favorite scenes in the movie is the street kids. And they're playing against the, the, the rich kids that have uniforms. And I'm not going to say how it went, but these kids knew how to play ball. So it, it touched my heart because I grew up. And, when, and then when you see things that, you, you know, you, they, they filmed it in areas you grew up, it, it touches more of your heart. Well, and you were a pretty good prep baseball player yourself, weren't you? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I could play. Yeah, I got, I got my, look at it, I got my baseball. I've had this shirt for years. You know, and this is what you wear. I, I, I love the sport. I might get into it, but the sport back then, I, I'm big at saying p- the purity of it. You know, you and I go back. I, I, I kind of agree with you. I like the old rules, but I'm hoping the game gets back to the days of the Sandlot, Natural, and Bull Durham, and maybe it will. Who knows? Well, and, and that's the beauty of baseball. It, it keeps evolving. It's, you know, baseball is more of a, a worldwide game now. It's not just the kids playing stickball in Brooklyn right. and – uh, Boston, it's it's truly a global game, and that's part of the appeal, but it's also part of the challenge, too, because uh, keeping kids involved in the United States and and, um, and uh, being able to enjoy the sport that has, in many ways, become so successful that it's, it's harder for kids to be able to afford to go to a game now or even watch on cable TV. If you don't have the money for cable TV, how do you watch your favorite baseball team on TV? Or even go to a game because everything is so... Baseball has become so successful, it is so expensive that, you know, how do you how do you protect the love of baseball for the next generation when it's priced out so many different people? So, yes, baseball has so many different issues in it. Um, but, it, you know, but it also... If, if, you, if you all ultimately boil it down to the purity of the love of baseball, um, the, the sport, even through strikes baseball is able to fix the avarice and fix the greed um, and bring it back to baseball, which, you know, it's, it's one of those perfectly designed sports that as badly as business people try and screw it up, baseball can fix itself. At least it has through 150 years. Uh, so uh, moving on to your uh, number six movie. This is a film directed by Billy Crystal, all things. Everyone knows Billy Crystal's a huge baseball fan, but he actually directed 61. He lived it. He lived his first directing debut, and it, it's, it's a story of... It's not so much a story of Roger Maris hitting 61 home runs and breaking Babe Ruth's record. It was the, it was the story of a friendship between him and... You found out that him and Mickey Mantle were really great friends, and Mickey Mantle rooted for him. And Mickey Mantle hit 59 that year. Mickey Mantle is played by Thomas Jane, and Maris is played by Barry Pepper. And it was just a really good, heartwarming story about two guys that had to deal with the New York media. And it showed Maris, who's from a small town in North Dakota, uh, just get beat down by the media and couldn't handle the pressure. And Mantle, who's his drinker and goes out dragging movie guy and parties all the time, he handled it. He handled and helped him through it. And there's a great scene in the movie where Mantle, because of his drinking and stuff, he's in the hospital, right? And he and he he, he finagles the nurses to to bring a TV, and he goes nuts, a la Dennis Hopper in Hoosiers when they hit the final shot. He goes nuts rooting for Maris to break that record, and when it could have easily been him because he missed the last week of the season. So there, it was a race between these guys to bake Brave Ruth. But the main core of that story, and I know you saw the movie, was how brilliantly. Crystal portrayed the friendship between two guys that are st- that are going for a record. Yeah, and, and it's uh, it's one of those things too. Like that really was a thing with Mickey Mantle. Here he here he is, the guy who's the switch hitting 
Hall of Famer, would eventually hit over 500 home runs, and yet he was human like the rest of us. And there were there was a time when Mickey Mantle was eventually suspended from baseball, a la Pete Rose, for gambling. Eventually reinstated, but but um, that that but that scene and that, that storyline in the film is absolutely. Uh, inspired what happened in real life in terms of the the demons that uh, Mickey Mantle had to face. Interesting too, the writer of this film is actually Hank Steinberg, which is not Hank Steinbrenner, the son of the owner. But uh, I did want to mention that as well. <laughs> Even though I was brain farting that it was Hank Steinbrenner, as I'm like, oh wow, it was written by Hank Steinbrenner. Actually, written by Hank Steinberg. That that's on me. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, this is, it's look, it's it's a lot of fun. It is an HBO movie, so it doesn't have the big budget treatment that a lot of other movies have on this list. But when you just go down through and you look at the people that signed up and were on this cast list that make small roles throughout the film, you have Anthony Michael Hall, you have Bruce McGill, Chris Bauer, Chris McDonald. So you know you have people in here that are huge in other films that, I, like you already mentioned. People that come in do a day or two of work because they love as as a favorite of the friend, but also because they like the script and they like what the project is doing and trying to say and the story they're trying to tell. So the fact that we have this great story of friendship between these two men, between Roger Maris and Nicky Mantle, and it's showing relatable things that they go through, the alcoholism of Nicky Mantle and the stress, the anxiety of Roger Maris, which really was a thing in real life. And if you go back and look at what happened, Roger Maris after this season. It's it's heartbreaking in many ways because the success of 61 in 1961 really did take a lifelong toll on Roger Maris. It really did affect his his lifelong journey. So yeah, I uh this is another this is another good film and uh yeah the, that's that that story of friendship is universal as well. I agree. And uh it, it, you know, you, you look at the list, and I have it at number six, but I could ease, I could I could change six through one, but it's, you know, one is one because it had the most effect on me, and I go by the ones that had effect on me, and then, and so, and you're right, you said the beginning of the, uh, of, of the, of the show, there's a hundred baseball movies, but the ones that I personally picked had an effect on me, and when it's a person, what's a story about uh, personal love between friends and that's what sometimes themes are baseball is a backdrop but you looked and, and and he did so much research billy crystal he's a diehard yankee fan he lived it he lived that and to find out what a great guy making all of maladies that mantle had my god dragon movie guy huge drunk but never not you know he's always ready to give an autograph and you know my dad rest in peace had the two greatest baseball players you ever saw were joe dimaggio and mickey mantle and that's it you know, that's, but that's that New York attitude. And um, yeah, I, I wish I would have, I wish I would have been alive to see that. That's baseball in its purest form. Imagine back then, well, the Dodgers, imagine back then, Brian, or Dragon Movie Guy in the 50s, when they had a triangle, you had in, in Queens, or uh, you, you had um, the Polo Grounds, which is, was the Giants, then Yankee Stadium, then Ebbets Field in Brooklyn. And my mother, rest in peace, would tell me stories that took place in that era about everyone play was called hooky. They would they would they would they wouldn't go to school because a lot of those games were, were, were during the day and baseball was everything. And the Vin Scullies and the Red Barbers and the Mel Allens and the transistor radio was everything to you and your culture as a sports fan back in that time. And look, um I wish I could I wish I would look I got a part of that in the sixties, but I wish we could relive that again. Yeah, and some of that cultural stuff is it's it, it's part of the times in which the baseball it, it's part of the times in which we're all raised in, and some sometimes pass uh, obviously. And I think the country is a lot more um, transitory. People move from city to city a lot more nowadays, and with so many more distractions like the internet and your cell phones and and on cable TV, that a lot of that kind of uh, that na- that neighborhood rivalry stuff, cross town rivalry. I think has been lost time, uh, which is unfortunate. But uh, you know, we we have we have so many other rivalries now, and so many other sports, and uh, it uh, you know, yeah, I think it it changes with time. And uh, yeah, you're right. A lot of that being lost to time, 
I think is uh, unfortunate in a lot of ways, but it is, it is also it, it also shows where we are as a country and, and where baseball is too. It's changing sure. with time. If we look and see that number, my number seven film is The Natural. This is this is a film that I think a lot of people would normally have higher on the list. This is considered an all time classic baseball movie. Robert Redford, Wilfred Brim, across the board, uh, brilliant performances. But if you look at the behind the scenes making of elements in this film, the filmmaking in in the baseball stadium, um, the baseball scenes are classic. But there's one shot in particular of Glenn Close, where they spent all day. They involved all kinds of NASA scientists. I don't know if they were actually with NASA, but they actually had scientists come out and figure out where. The, the shaft of light coming down the uh, coming down out of the stands. There's a scene where Robert Robert Redford hits a big home run, and they wanted to have Glenn Close this big shaft of actual natural sunlight hitting her, and they had to do it. They had to place her in the stands where the shaft would be at a certain time of day, and they did it. And it's Hollywood magic, and you you see it, and it's the kind of thing that you can't fake on film it's not even one that you could really bring in a bunch of lights into it's the kind of thing that only natural sunlight coming through a tunnel and shining on a woman in the crowd at just the right time at just the right angle for just the right shot in just the right movie it's that kind of filmmaking um that makes that and that's just one shot in this considered great hollywood classic of the natural robert redford's performance the guy that doesn't get to the big leagues until much later in life. So he actually appreciates where he is. It's not just the rich millionaire player. It is the guy living out his childhood dream. So for all those reasons, uh, The Natural is number seven on my list. Uh, surprisingly not higher in some respects, but uh, uh, the other films that are uh, higher on the list as well uh, have reasons for being where they are. Uh, other thoughts on The Natural? We said it all. You know, I yeah. Just- it's go, go back. I mean, some of the films I have on my list talk about baseball that takes place back in the 40s, the 20s, the 30s, and the 50s. That's the golden age of baseball. Yeah, and, and a lot of these on your list I, I have not seen. Um, so, yeah, so we can talk about that, too. Uh, okay. Moving on to my number six. This is one that it's it's been a little while. I didn't do a rewatch for this list, but... Um, Anyone of a certain age has seen The Bad News Bears. And if you haven't seen The Bad News Bears, you've seen one of the many, many, many... I didn't count them up. I probably should have. I didn't do that part of the homework. (laughs) But when you look at a film that is so successful, it spawns multiple sequels of decreasing quality as they go along. That does reflect on the success and how good and how well achieved the original film was. And the original Bad News Bears comes out in 1976. There's no way you could make this film nowadays because, well, Walter Matthau of The Odd Couple and of Grumpy Old Men, classic Hollywood actor Walter Matthau, plays an alcoholic, a hardcore alcoholic, whose sentence is to coach children. This is not a good idea. (laughs) Why is this an idea that the, the legal system would propose? But yet somehow, the alcoholic coach in Walter Matthau takes his Bad News Bears and they make a run to the championship. A lot of the the characters in this film are great archetypes. You have Kelly Slater, the bad boy, who's got the motorbike, who's probably theoretically a little bit too old to be playing in Little League, but they still still manage to get him in the game. You have Tatum O'Neill, Ryan O'Neill's daughter, who would eventually get an Oscar nomination or win, I forget which, uh, for Paper Moon, playing the girl, playing baseball. You have the collection of oddballs and misfits and rejects, and somehow this is a team, the team that finds a way to come together and win the big game and spur on tons of sequels. So uh, it's, it's one of those things where Bad News Bears is very much a product of its time. It came out in 1976. It is... A lot of fun. It is great. It's simple storytelling. Uh, it's not based off of anything real, as far as I can tell. But uh, 
it is inspirational to all of those little league teams that are that are not the little league all stars that go on to play in the little league World Series every year. This is not dedicated to all those teams playing on ESPN every every August, July, and August. This is the misfits, the forgotten, the looked overs, the left behinds. This is everyone but the kids in the Little League World Series, and yet somehow they still find a way to come together and win. And that is why it is number six on my list. Thoughts on the bad news on the bad news bears? I had a huge crush on Tatum O'Neill because I was 16 when that movie came out, and she's gorgeous. I was such my heart was broken when she married that dork John McEnroe, you know. So that that killed me. Uh, Those darn tennis players. You know, know, the one thing I noticed about that movie because I'm 16 years old, I'm playing ball, is that Walter Matthau has a can of beer in his hand the entire time he's coaching. He never goes out there and shows during practice. You know, when you coach baseball, your coach shows you. Get down on the ball, you know, hold your hands like this. He just, he just, dude, he was just a drunk. And um, you're right. As entertaining as it was, it was unrealistic, but it worked. A, a can of beer in his hand the entire time. And even the movie pass poster has him smoking a cigar. Can you yeah. imagine? I mean, we, we've got a lot of great uh, Little League teams that have gone to the Little League World Series here in Las Vegas. Can you imagine any of the coaches nowadays? Showing up to a ballpark around all those kids with a can of beer and a cigar. <laughs> those those coaches would be kicked out immediately. And yet somehow in the 1970s, uh, he was a role model. Uh, <laughs> no, go, 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 I, I want to jump on that and, and kind of segue into my, my dad, you know, got me into sports. Huge sports fan. Huge baseball guy. He's a Hall of Fame uh, baseball player at the high school he went to. And he, you talk about that. And I remember what got me into the Raiders, and you say, kid, come here, come here. And he would show Kenny Stabler, the quarterback of the Raiders. He's sitting on the sideline. He's he's smoking a cigarette and drinking a Coors. And we're so woke culture right now. I'm thinking, what's wrong with that? But, guys, if you're winning the game 37 to nothing and you're having a beer because people in the stands are having a beer, you're not going back in the game. Have a freaking cigarette. But, again, you know, we can't – a lot of things you can't do nowadays that they did back then. You're right. We, You know, I, I hate that. I hate when we say – about films they could never do that today you know why not do it in today be yourself i'm just making a political statement on dragon movie guys baseball thing because i thought that was great that he drank a beer in 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 the uh in the day he never sat there and offered a beer to the kids you know he wasn't sitting there saying hey by the way it's getting double go get a beer no you know well and if i remember right kenny stabler he was actually drinking Coors, not Coors light he was drinking the original OG Coors, if I remember right. So yeah. <laughs> that that would be fascinating to see uh, him do uh, in in uh, that. It'd be fascinating and anyone to try and do that nowadays with the way uh, we all are, and well, and, and just with with uh, with the way health and nutrition and all that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, I, no yeah. one could really get away with that with the uh, with that, everything. That's a whole other podcast, buddy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's move on to your number uh, number five. This yeah. is a classic all-time film. This is Major League, 1989. Yeah. I talked earlier about people having to learn how to play baseball. Tom Berenger, Wesley Snipes, most of that cast had to have six weeks of training and had to glove the ball, had to throw the ball, had to hit the ball. Two guys didn't. Corbin Burnson, who played third base, who played Dorn, and Charlie Sheen. I remember Charlie Sheen in high school in L.A. Massive pitchers. He he could have gone, he could have gone and played college ball, but of course he got into acting. So, you know, classic film uh, to me of my list. It's 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 a comedy in there about a team, the Cle- and the Cleveland Indians that stink, and the owner. Gorgeous lady, I forgot what her or the actress's name. If she loses enough games, she can move the team to Florida or something like that, and they end up winning enough games. The guy who played the manager, he's in a million things in that raspy voice. Fun movie, just a lot of fun. Um, it, it's what's the word I'm looking for? It's uh, you know pretty much uh, a, a, a script that foreshadows a lot and. But it works. Does that make sense? It works. Yeah, yeah. and uh, James Gammon was the guy who played <laughs> Lou Brown, the manager. 
And yeah. I believe it's Margaret Witten who played Rachel Phelps. The I think that's the owner that you're the talking woman. about. The yeah. the uh, the the former. If I remember right, I think she was a cocktail girl at a casino or something that the old owner married, and then he dies, and she wants the whole thing is she wants to make the film the the team. She wants to make the team as bad as possible to move to Miami so she can get sunlight. Right. <laughs> if I remember right, she is uh, yeah one of the one of the great foils in in baseball movie history for sure. Absolutely. Sure. And and talk a little bit more about um seeing. Charlie Sheen playing baseball in high school. You actually got that that up that up front. He he, he was phenomenal fastball, phenomenal curveball. Um, great kid. I mean, you know, we all grew up in that part of L.A. and he was younger than I am, but he he was a stud. And his brother was a stud wrestler. Emilio was a stud wrestler, and they used that in the movie Breakfast Club. They was a wrestler, but Emilio Estevez is a little shorter. Charlie Sheen had command, and so he had little little technical training when he went into it, and that's one thing I remember when they're doing the making of the film, and I saw it on VH1, and and Corbin Burnson must have played somewhere in his life because the rest of the cast, you would think Wesley, you know, I don't know Wesley Snipes, Tom Berenger, the um, oh god, the guy that played the um, uh, Dennis Haysbert, who's yeah. now in all the, the president, the, <laughs> yeah, it, they all had to learn how to play baseball. I get it, you know, you you don't if you don't if you look like you don't know how to stand right, it comes out on film. If you don't go for the ball and I think it's great the way they put put that whole thing together. I don't know. You know better than I do who wrote and directed it because you're a dragon movie guy. But I do know that the formula of making a team for, the, for them to root for because you're going up against the owner. And Bob Euchre is great. He's an old Milwaukee Brewers owner. I, Bob Euchre is great. He's great in the Miller Lite commercials. I mean, that's what he stands yeah. out as. And he's great as announcer on the team. He's always drinking that a Jack Daniels bottle. Yeah. It's a comedy. It's a comedy, and it's 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 about a bunch of guys that lose. And they finally win. Now, is is did you actually? Uh, he's a little bit younger than you are. Did you actually face off versus Charlie Sheen? Get the batter's no, box. I the... Play. No, no, I did not. did not face off against him. But I, I didn't want to. But I just know by living in Los Angeles and just knowing his story. And yeah. <laughs> you know his story now that he's a phenomenal baseball player, and um, he, and he used it. He was able to use it in the movie. And you you can really see that too. The 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 wild thing in wild thing yeah. in Ricky Vaughn um, is definitely all Charlie Sheen. And this was written and directed by David Ward, by the way. Yeah. Not not familiar with his other work, but uh, he did write and direct Major League. And you write too, also about um, Bob Euchre. And for anyone old enough to remember Mr. Belvedere, Bob Euchre was the classic sitcom dad in an '80s sitcom. Who was the you know he's Bob Euchre. It's you know he there's there's a reason why we still say just a bit outside. That's Bob Euchre. That is pure Bob Euchre. And I know lots of people. He he does have a he does have a colorful reputation at best in real life. Well earned. Definitely influenced by I'm sure his success and uh, his uh, his time. And he actually was a real life ball player at one point too. That made the big show for and a minuscule amount of time. But uh, the Milwaukee Brewers for years. I think he retired, but he's a Milwaukee Brewers play by play announcer and and he, and he got the fame by doing the Miller Light commercials like John Madden. That Miller Light commercial he does where he goes, Look at these seats that I got, and he's sitting in the top row of the stadium. You hear him scream, he missed a tag. I mean, I I can I laugh every time I saw that. Go on YouTube and, and look at Bob Euchre's Miller Light commercials and you'll laugh your ass off. And and he did he did those Miller Lite commercials for years and years and years and yeah they would they would replay a lot of them but he would sure. come out with new ones and you you know you could you could tell the the hairlines were shading a little bit the paunches coming up a little bit but he still he filmed so many of those year after year after year and they were all they're always great um, great pieces of advertising and uh, and fun as well so that's why they get replayed all the time. Uh, and going to your number, we just did number five. Your number four is one I have not seen this movie. This is 1973, Bang the Drum Slowly. Tearjerker. The absolute character piece. It's the second film Robert De Niro did after Mean Streets. It's Michael Moriarty uh, and Robert De Niro. And Moriarty's this jocular, 
pitcher, fictitious team, well, obviously, a, you know, a pro team, but it's fictitious. And he develops a relationship, uh, a friendship with the guy that's his catcher, who's as laconic and quiet as there is, and can't figure out why. And the guy, the, 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 unbeknownst to everyone, he's got uh, stage four Hodgkin's disease. And he's trying to keep it from the team because De Niro's a great player and De Niro's just as quiet can be. And he doesn't like the fact that this guy's so out there and, 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 and full of life. And you saw that you see their relationship go through this film. It's very, 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 very I'm not going to give away the end. You can figure it out, but it's a tearjerker. But it baseball unites two guys from two different backgrounds. And they couldn't be any more far apart in personality. I recommend it. It came out in 1973. I've seen this film 20 times because like films that you see that you, the performance are so great, but they're under the radar, which you would call, because you're a Dragon movie guy, an indie film that is so good. This film would have won Sundance. It was a million dollar budget back then, 1973. You know? And nominated which, for an Oscar. What? Nominated Gar- for one Oscar. Yeah, yeah Vincent Gardino, who you would know, who played the, a great role, the father in Moonstruck, you know, Olympia Caucus's husband. And he was also a great, great football movie when I was a kid called Heaven Can Wait with Warren Beatty. And he, Vince Gardenia played the police. He's a character actor you've seen in a million things. He was nominated for, for, for the Academy Wright, right, for Best Supporting Actor. Highly recommend it. Um, there's, there's nothing great about it except it's a great film because of the performances and the acting and a relationship between two guys that couldn't come from two different backgrounds. Is this similar to Brian's song in that regard? I've yeah. not actually seen Brian's song either, but it sounds very similar in that regard. Yeah, well, yeah, well, you, you obviously, well, Brian's song is great because it's a true story about, you know, Brian Gale's Piccolo and Piccolo. the Bears. Yeah, and you cry, and, and it, you know, there, I remember when Brian's song came out in 1971, and it was the only film that my, besides one of the films I have on my list here, it was the only film that my grandfather would cry every time you saw it because it was so it was so sad same thing for this film you know it's not you have this we have the sandlot major league 61 natural bull durham fun films good endings this is not but it's it's but baseball the theme of this is baseball and it's how baseball unites people that couldn't be any different and how Michael Moriarty's personality I, I you know him better as an actor than I do he's in a lot of TV movies and stuff like that it's how he engages this guy that just wants to keep this hidden. Doesn't want anyone to know. So, and it's it's weird to think too. Michael Moriarty, I think as I always think of Michael Mori- Moriarty mostly as one of the original actors on the first couple of seasons of Law and Order. So when I think of Michael Moriarty, I think of him as the ad- assistant district attorney before Sam Waterston comes along. So right. <laughs> it, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's him, the, the veteran actor when he was a younger man. And it's to see Robert De Niro in a sports movie when he was still young enough, obviously to play the role that just shows how early it was in Robert De Niro's car- career that he was doing a sports flick. Nails uh, it. Yeah. Nails he, it. The catcher he, nails it. Nails it. And so at, at, yeah, right. After Mean Streets, before Taxi Driver. Before Godfather Part Two, sure. if I remember right. So yeah. this is this is right before he, he he's a name, but he's not he's not Robert De Niro yet. I mean, he's Robert De Niro, but he's not Robert De Niro as of yet. So yeah, that is it, it is fascinating to see. Um, and I, again, I've not seen this. I'm just kind of judging this based off of the IMDb page and, and hearing hearing your stories about uh, you, about this film. Uh, let's look at. Going over to uh, my list, we have coming in at number five. One you already had on your list. This is my list. It is number five. It is Bull Durham. It is Kevin Costner. It is probably the most. Kevin Costner's done three baseball movies in his career. This is probably the most, the most baseball, pure baseball film of the three, in my opinion, that Kevin Costner did. This is Kevin Costner as Crash Davis, as the minor league catcher, the guy who's still grinding away in the minor leagues, and the young phenom coming up who's not exactly the most focused, but heck, he he, he loved his co-star enough to actually marry her in real life, so the chemistry was actually real between Tim Robbins and Susan Sarandon. They actually got married 
in real life after being involved in the film. So you know the chemistry is good if it spills over into a marriage that's lasted 30 plus years. Classic baseball tale, classic minor league baseball tale too, because minor league baseball stories don't get as much air as all the major league stories do for a lot of obvious reasons. But minor league baseball stories have so many wild characters. And you see a lot of those come up in this film. It is a lot of classic Hollywood tropes, a lot of baseball movie tropes. But in the hands of these filmmakers and in these actors, there's a reason. As You, know, you mentioned Danny Gans. Danny Gans was a big-time Las Vegas performer for 25 years before his untimely death. There, there's a reason why, if you look at one of the early episodes of Family Guy, there's a reason why... As they're as the Family Guy team, as the Griffins are driving around Las Vegas, they go, "Wow, Danny Gans, Entertainer of the Year!" Because <laughs> when I first moved here in 2006, there were billboards everywhere talking about Danny Gans and how he's the eternally the Entertainer of the Year. Never said what year, but they just said Entertainer of the Year. Great strip performer was was he was you know front and center on the marquee at the Mirage. Um, all that to say that you get glimpses of that in his small supporting role when he actually was a real minor league baseball player in Bull Durham in the 1980s when they made Bull Durham when they shot it in 86, 87, came out in 88. So, I, yeah, this is, this is one that uh, Bull Durham ends up, I think, a lot higher on most people's list than it does on mine. It's, uh, this, this is a film that came out when, it was thir- when I was 13, so I didn't see it right away when I was junior high school it's a little bit more adult than that i think it's kind of more high school than junior high um but this is one that is it's an all-time classic baseball movie for a reason it's one that people still talk about for a reason so all of that bull durham great film number five on my list uh, other thoughts on bull durham yeah great to you you're 13 so that comes out i'm 28 so that scene when he's doing her toenails and he's banging with the with the with the uh, the, the the you know the little uh, candles going on. There's erotic sex scenes in this thing. So you know, Susan Sarandon is hot. Was hot. She's still good looking for an older woman. Back then, she had that cur- that curvy uh, you know body. And then the, what was the girl? What was the other one that that it was a hooker and she marries the guy that's a that's a Jesus freak that's on the team, you know. And she's banged everyone on the team. And there's a lot of sexual innuendos in this film, which made it again, you know, added a lot to what you said earlier, just said, well, I totally agree with strange things happen in the minor leagues. And, and yeah, the, 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 uh, the, the streetwalker lady marrying the religious fanatic. Wow. That is, that is yeah. something that uh, it's, it's, it's so strange. It probably is based off of actual real life stories somewhere along the way. Uh, this is a film that, and you're right, it, I was probably a little bit young at the time uh, to watch this film, given given the adult nature of it. But it reflects the life of baseball players. You know, people always forget, too, when you're a, ba- a minor league baseball player, you can get called up or released or sent down at any time. So these are not people that are 35-year-olds with a wife and kids they go home to every night. This, these are people that are transitory they're working their way up in their career they're mostly in their 20s if they are like kevin costner's character they are in their 30s still hanging on but they're not they're not settled at where they are in life so they are kind of at that experimental period they are in that that have fun but also work that live hard and play hard time of life so yeah it's i I, that's part of what makes all the minor league baseball stories so interesting so fascinating so entertaining is all of that in this, uh, in, uh, in Bull Durham. This is 13 years, 1988, so 1975, she does Rocky Horror Picture Show. Interesting to see her still playing a sexy role, still, but kind of adapting to where she is in life at that point, too. But knowing that people know it's, this is throughout Susan Sarandon, this is, this is, damn it, Janet. 13 years later. Was she the one that banged Brad Pitt and Thelma Louise or was it Gina Davis? Because she was hot in that too, you know? Yeah, and that was three years after this. I 
I can't remember. It's been a while since I watched Thelma movies. Lucky Brad Pitt. My, yeah, my, my guess is that they probably both um, had a go at Brad Pitt. Because at, at that point, Brad Pitt is the... Uh, He's the young shirtless guy that they pick up as a as a hitchhiker. I mean, Brad Pitt had been around for a couple of years, but he he wasn't really Brad Pitt as of yet. So, um, I my guess is that they probably both had to go. But then again, that was that was such a uh, an emotional film for both those actresses, kind of escaping bad marriages. That I don't know. Yeah. I can't remember who who slept with who in uh, the Hunger Games off the top of my head. I need to rewatch. Well, I slept with both of them in a fantasy, so. <laughs> <laughs> the real the, the real fish comes out so i yeah i i i think you know, most yeah. of us at one time or another uh probably have been there right there with you uh in in that uh in that well, in that yeah the randon's got great eyes her eyes are so intoxicating that and she's a great actress so you could see um you know and she she still works you know she's like i said I just she still looks reference. good she still looks good even now, and and her daughter was very attractive too. So, yeah, it's it's uh, and she yeah you know, she took very good care of herself for uh all all, all of these years. Sure. Uh, let's move on to your number three film. Your number three film is also on my list. This is another Kevin Costner flick. This is Field of Dreams. Yeah. Do you ever have films? I have a few that they come on, you watch them. Goodfellas is one of them. The Godfathers. Uh, you know, there's there's certain movies that, oh, I got to watch this because Field of Dreams is one of them. On my list, this is the most creative movie. Um, it, it it But it's basically a story about a guy that had a contentious relationship with his father and his father died young and and it's how they reunite and what happens. And in in this movie, the acting is phenomenal. Timothy Busfield s- steals the film in his role as uh, what's it, what's it, Mad- Amy Madigan who plays Costner's, oh. it's his brother, right? Um, I wish I knew the the line, but what this theme of this show that you have on today is baseball. And James Earl Jones has the greatest line when he's trying. Kevin Costner builds a feet. Like, he gets rid of all the corn he has, in, in, which is his job. Which he's a farmer, right? And he builds a baseball field because a voice tells him, "If you build it, they will come." And then one day, all these players from the past, Ty Cobb, all the I'm not Ty Cobb, but Shoeless Joe Jackson, a lot of players that played in that era that are ghosts come and play on this field. Only he could see it, his wife could see it, his daughter could see it. And then eventually it develops into a relationship with, I can't get into the story with uh, with, with James Earl Jones, but he goes on a hunt because these voices tell him to go around the country and find people that have a relation to this field. James Earl Jones, maybe you could tell the audience, that line when it says something like, Ray, don't sell this field, because he's losing money, he can't make it, he can't make a living. And he's about to get foreclosed upon. And he's trying to tell everyone, hey, there's baseball players out there. No one could see him. And James Earl Jones goes, don't sell this field because baseball marks the time. It reminds us of what was good and what will be good again. And that's the theme of baseball. And that's what I took from this movie. It is one of the all-time great uh, speeches in a movie. It is one of the all-time great James Earl Jones speeches. And just to say how big this speech that James Earl Jones has in Field of Dreams, this is a speech that um, that was said that was spo- uh, that was performed by Vin Scully. And Vin Scully recently passed away, but this is this is a, uh, a speech that Vin Scully redid in Vin Scully's syrupy, caramelly sweet, you know, all time great voice. That he even reset multiple times, and I remember when Vin Scully passed away. They one of the things they were showing was Vin Scully reciting James Earl Jones' speech from sure. Field of Dreams. It, it is an all time, you know. It's people will come, Ray. People will get in their car. You know, there's it's that whole thing. It's it's quotable. It's relatable. It's 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 magical, and. It's James Earl Jones being James Earl Jones without the Darth Vader sound effects. So this is James <laughs> Earl Jones uh, as his character, but it, it's it's him 
fully embodying the role and seeing it and being the the persnickety old guy who is who's no longer the true believer that his character was in real life in in a you know based off a of real life actual our, our, uh, author back in the day that they quote from the 60s and all that kind of stuff and Terrence the, Mann yeah Terrence Mann based off of an actual I forget who it was but he was actually based off a of real life philosophical leader of the 1960s right. and the fact that he is the guy who no longer is the true believer, he's no longer the guy who's trying to fight the fight. He just wants to be left alone, and Kevin Costner's character goes and drags him back in. And the fact that after that big, huge character arc, his character makes this speech in only the way that James Earl Jones could do. Uh, in a brilliant, uh, it's brilliant casting any time you put James Earl Jones in something, but it's, this is an all-time casting great decision. There of, of the nine films that I have, seven I've seen in the theater. One that's coming up, I was too young, and then another one was on HBO, which was sixty-one. There wasn't a dry eye in the theater when Kevin Costner's voice breaks and says, "Dad, do you want to have a catch?" Because and you'll know what that means. You have to see this film. I'm sure most of your audience has, because it has such a brilliant ending about a man that's able to have redemption with. The, if you've ever had some contention with your dad. Some of us have, and he, he never, he's able to have a resolution and closure. And that's what the film's about. Sometimes films where baseball is involved in the film, but it's about a love story. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think a lot of, and this goes beyond baseball, but I think a lot of sports movies in general have a lot of, in order to bring in the non sports fan, I think producers and directors stick in non-sports stories into sports movies to make them more relatable to a larger audience. And I think in, in general, that's a detriment to the film and a, and a detriment to the sports story being told. But in this case, the stories of redemption for James Earl Jones and the father and son dynamic being told about, uh, about Ray and his father enhances the baseball it doesn't take away from it it doesn't distract from it it does it's not one that you go well yeah it's a baseball movie but really it's about something else this is this is one where baseball and the family story is so intermingled it's so intertwined and even the whole whispered build it and he will come to build it and he will come even that whole thing um you, it, you obviously have us on your list yeah did you not did you not get that certain feel of just pure purity between the character of Shoeless Joe Jackson, by the way, played by Ray Liotta, rest in peace, one of my favorite actors of all time, and his relationship with the Ray Kinsella character played by Kevin Costner. There was a bonding there throughout the generations. And, and Shoeless Joe Jackson is that caveat between, the, he's the one that is the first player to come back. And there's a scene in that movie too, where he goes, I would have played this game for nothing, you know, which no one knows his story. And there's another, remember the line when he said, we invited Ty Cobb to come, but no one liked the son of a bitch when he was alive. You know, there was such great stuff in there. Hey, how about the one guy that says to, to, to the costume in the film, one of the old ball players, and he says, you got a cigarette? He goes, no, he goes, yeah, I, got a, I quit 66 years ago. Boy, could I use a cigarette? I mean, it was so well <laughs> written. And I don't remember who wrote the film. You need to you need to t uh, refresh me on that. How many times have you seen the movie? And and of course it came out in '89, so you're still what? 15 I'm 14. I, I saw it in theaters. Uh, it came out in 1989, so I'm 14 when I see it. This yeah. is Phil Alden Robinson, and the writers were W. P. Kinsella and and Phil Alden Robinson. So, I I heard a story. Don't know how. I don't. I I I'll say it. Don't know how the I don't know how true it is, is that Phil Alden Robinson wrote the script and couldn't get it sold, and he got to the point where um, I, how do I say this? He he tried to do something to his life like take it, all right, and he's down and out, and his sister brings him to a Hollywood party because his sister's in the business, and she says, Phil, I want you to meet a guy named Kevin Costner, and Costner goes, I hear you wrote you written a script, gives it to Costner, gets done. You know, that's I, I, I've heard that story before in the business, but Phil Alden Robinson had that script. That's why that when you've said his name, I remember 
I don't know what he's done since then. And if he did anything, if he didn't do anything, that film still to this day, I can watch it every single time it comes on. Not many it, people will say that about films. There's films you, what, what, give me two films you see that you can watch it every time it comes on. Oh, um, off the top of my head, Forrest Gump. Great. And the first Star Wars movie. Just, uh, yep. The, oh, yeah. And, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, other ones obviously too, but as far as like all time crack greats that no matter, no matter where you are, what time of day, what day of the week, what day of the year, what, what, what you're doing, if it comes on TV, you, you sit down and watch five minutes of it, regardless of what scene it is. If, if it's, if it's a film like that where it's an all time classic and it hits you right in the, you know, hits you right in the chest, right in the solar plexus, um, this is, this, you're right. This is, this is one of those films that when, Field of Dreams comes on. You sit down for five minutes and watch a scene or two. This is one that I have not seen. This Shock. is from 1942. I've heard of Gary Cooper. I can't think I've seen anything with wow. him actually in it. But this is the pride of the Yankees. Vince Scully, you brought up, said it's the greatest baseball movie of all time. I brought my grandfather into the equation. And I said that he cried in Brian's song. And he cried in this because he lived it. Babe Ruth's actually in this movie. And it's a true story of Lou Gehrig, of what he went through. Cooper plays Lou Gehrig. Uh, Walter Wintel's in it. I, I think Cooper got a, a, a whatchamacallit. I think he got an Academy Award nomination. It, it's another tearjerker. Everyone knows what a great player Lou Gehrig was, but how humble he was. And what a great story he had growing up. And his, his parents spoke, came over from Italy, and they spoke broken English, and they didn't want him playing baseball, but he was that good. And he lives the American dream. He becomes a Yankee. And then he gets this horrible disease called arterial lateral sclerosis, as we all know, is ALS that's affected even athletes that we know, like Steve Gleason, in modern times at the New Orleans Saints. And and um, it's how he never complained. And he kept, and then finally, he set the record. He played 2,000-something consecutive games, and then Cal Ripken broke the record. And there's a famous line they show in the movie. He was walking out, and he goes, he, he addresses Yankee Stadium. And he says, I have to be the luckiest man alive, you know, and I, I, I implore you watch this film. And, well, it, are, it is so you could you can go on Amazon right now or Netflix and, and hit the search button and get it. And it's black and white and it's absolute tearjerker. But Babe Ruth's in the movie. Is this uh, the uh, is this the I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth? Yeah, you know, I consider myself. Alone, self. So. Sam Malone stole that goddamn line at the end of Cheers when because they did the same thing. Gary Cooper walks, the Lou Gehrig walks into a dugout and it fades to black. And if you remember the end of Cheers, did you watch the last mm -hmm. episode of Cheers? Sam Malone walks into the, the end of, out of the bar and it fades to black and he goes, I'm the luck. Well, he said, I'm the luckiest son of a bitch alive. And he stole that. I said, oh my God, he stole that from, from Pride of the Yankees. All I could say is you haven't seen the film, but it is considered, I think, uh, I could easily have it at number one because of what it meant to the sport of baseball to have all the old people in there. And then, of course, Lou Gehrig to this day is still he, he, he's still deified, you know, and, and it's unfortunate that they haven't. It's a disease that he had that they still haven't found a cure for. And watch the film. That's all I could say. The way he handled his life and the way he handled it. And it, it's, it's sad. Very sad. Well, and and uh, that that scene, the today I consider it, that's based off of an actual real life speech that's out there that's very well known, and anyone can you know go on YouTube, go on Google, and and, and call up both the Gary Cooper version and the Lou Gehrig actual recording and video of, and if I, if I remember right, I think I watched it both at some point, and Gary Cooper's performance of that speech is very similar to the real life, including the echo effect of just the very heartfelt today I consider myself uh, speech. One of the great all time. I, and, you know, did he, did he write it beforehand or was that just all off the cuff? I don't know if we'll ever really know, but uh, it, you know, just a, a great, um, a great sports moment that is larger than sports but still embodies the sport of baseball because for a guy to go to, you know, that's the other thing too with, with the consecutive games streak that Lou Gehrig had that eventually was broken by, by Cal Ripken jr. But it took 40 or 50 years for Cal Ripken jr. To break that streak. That's a streak that hasn't been talked about a lot 
since Cal Ripken. But if you really think about just you and me and everyone else that grinds away day after day after day, most people are not Hall of Famer millionaires that retire at 35 and never work another day in the, the rest of their life. Most people work every day. And there's something about baseball in that era where, where you know, those the, the baseball players of that era had off-season jobs. They weren't millionaires for the most part. So the fact that Lou Gehrig was not a millionaire, showed up every day, went to work, he did it. That's something that people can, of any era, can relate to. It's, it's, it's one of those things, it's one of the reasons why I love baseball. It is that, that, that work ethic, that, that thing where people who aren't millionaires, who, who work every day, who never get the acclaim, who never get the herald, work hard and they show up every single day. And maybe that maybe they're great at what they do, maybe they're not, maybe they're just putting food on the table. But that quality, that work ethic, I think is is something that resonates through time. And yeah, we, we you know, the, you're right, ALS but it, for the longest time, it was called Lou Gehrig's disease. It, you know, it's, still it's, is. And, and look, look at the effect. By the way, um, you, you talk about Cal Ripken Jr. He always pay homage to Lou Gehrig and said, "I, I, I and, and look, Lou Cal Ripken could have taken days off because they was was making millions." But another guy, you never think about this. Uh, I, I don't want to go to football, but Brett Favre never missed a game. Played what two hundred and thirty eight straight games. He played with a broken. Football is a lot harder. You and I talk about. It. You know, off the record, we talk about sports injuries and football is the most. But he always said, "I'm the." He goes, "I'm the Lou Gehrig of the National Football League," and that says a lot when you bring him up in that aspect. And football is a harder sport to to not get injured in. It's just like I said, he 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 was a great American hero, and 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 it also portrayed how his parents had to deal with it. These two people that came over from Italy, they had to learn English, and they watched their son go through this thing, and and. Uh, and the wife, by the way, I, I forgot her name, not the actress, but um, she uh, she rallied and bantered to do uh, a, a, a lot of work um, philanthropic wise for ALS. And she was a long time his wife um, for years. And never, El- I don't think she ever remarried. Eleanor Garrick? Yeah, yes. Played she, by Teresa Wright in the film. Beautiful. Beautiful and, girl. And, and just interesting, too. He's on the movie poster, but it is a little bit surreal right now for me to be looking at the IMDb page and third billing, third billing in this movie from 1942. And Babe Ruth passed away, I think, in 1946. The fact right. that Babe Ruth is credited as playing Babe Ruth. That was insane. It, it was it, great. It brings up, uh, you know, it brings up chills to think that Babe Ruth played well, Babe Ruth in a film. Look at this dragon movie. Look at the symmetry that he and Lou Gehrig had the same relationship that, and we talked about it earlier, that Maris and Mantle had. Two Yankee, four Yankee greats, and they got along like brothers. That doesn't happen in every sport. You know, to today, it just came out, and I don't want to get you off the subject, but Derek Jeter and Alex Rodriguez, two Yankees, did not get along great, you know? And they won. They won the World Series in 2008 or nine. But you have four, and look, Derek Jeter and Alex Rodriguez are icons in the sport. But back in those days, man, he, he, I, Gary and Gary could have been any further from Babe Ruth was a partier, <laughs> drank beer and partied and had girls on the thing. This guy was a married man. Maris, married man, kids. Uh, he was a Derek Carr of the Yankees. You know, drank milk at dinner, and and Mickey Mantle had hookers and, and, and booze in the in the box cars on the train. So it just goes with baseball brought them together, uh, and what it does, it brings people together. Sandlot. And hope that's the theme of your show. So, yeah, and, and the, the, uh, you're right. Babe Ruth would have been uh, Babe Ruth would have been best friends with David Wells and Odell Beckham Jr. if he were alive today. <laughs> <laughs> very, very similar lifestyle choices oh, that uh, those three guys have shared oh. over over the years. Back to my number four. We're gonna do my number four, and number three. Uh, and then, well, we're gonna do my number four, my number three, and my number two because uh, I skipped over them at some point here, but uh, A League of Their Own from 1992 is my number four movie. This is, I worked at a movie theater for seven years through high school and college. I wasn't fully on the Van Wilder plan as of yet, but seven years at a movie theater. Starting when I was 16, 
A League of Their Own was one of the films that was playing at the theater that I worked at. when I, The very first day that I worked at a movie theater that started to be on I, a 30-plus year arc to where I am now sitting in the seat sitting talking wait, about wait, movies. Wait a minute. You're the original Mark Ratner from Fast Times at Ridgemont High that worked at the... Did you, did you manage the movie theater? No, 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 no. Oh, God, no. Managers... No, that's that's management, man. That's... That's uh, that, that's moving up, and that, no, that's you know, this is me at sixteen, uh, being a high school student, uh, you know, playing in band, being on the swim team, being a lifeguard, all that while working at the movie theater. Um, but this is also, this is a great film in and of itself. Yeah, it's it tells the story of women playing major league baseball during World War II when most of the men were off fighting um, in World War II. There was a real life, uh, not playing Major League Baseball, but there was a thing called the All American Women's Baseball something or other, and it was an attempt to get women involved in the war effort against the Nazis against the Japanese in World War II, and it was them playing baseball instead of softball in an attempt to uh, get fans in support of the war effort and still have something to watch and be entertained by. This is one of the great unheralded directors of all time who was one of the great comedic performers of all time. Uh, this is, of course, Laverne from Laverne and Shirley as director of the film. And uh, a great, uh, you know, the great Gina Davis. This is very petty. This is this is even David L. Lander in a non-squiggy role as the baseball play-by-play guy from the stadium. This is, of course, Tom Hanks. And it's still a comedic role, but it's a dramatic comedic role and one of his first drama roles. Um, it's not nearly... It, it, it didn't get an Oscar nomination, but it is a year before he got nominated and won for Philadelphia and two years before Forrest Gump. So it is that turn in Tom Hanks' career where he starts to go from making Joe versus the volcano and a man with one wet red shoe to being the dramatic actor we know and love today. This is Tom Hanks playing an alcoholic retired veteran who is recruited by Gary Marshall to coach girls. <laughs> this is, this is that movie. This is, you know, there's no crying in baseball. It is that crap. Classic all time line. It is still still well angel. It is all of those things. It is my number four movie on uh, this list, and part of the reason why it's my number four movie too is it's time and place in my life. But it's also it's baseball. It's it's those performances. It's it's Madonna and Tom Hanks in the same movie at the peak of their careers, and somehow it works. If, if you say Madonna from nineteen ninety two, this is when she's doing her sex video. This is when she's doing all of those, all of the, the, the peak Madonna-ness, right? It's, it's peak Madonna. Vogue, she's you know, coming up Vogue. This is Tom Hanks as he's heading, go, about to go into his peak. You don't think of those two stars at that time being in the same film together, and yet somehow she's all the way May, and he is the, uh, the point of view character through which we see this film, along with Dottie, along with uh, Dottie Hanson, so... Uh, yeah, all those reasons are why A League of Their Own is my number four film. Th- thoughts on A League of Their Own? Uh, I saw it. I don't have it in my top nine. Entertaining. Um, I'm a sick bastard, as you know. You know me. We're friends. Um, I'll, if I was in that situation, um, I would have tried to sleep with every one of those players except Rosie O'Donnell. You know? <laughs> I mean, Lori Petty was good looking back then. Remember her? She was in, um, oh, God. She was Tank in the Girl. Um, Oh, Johnny Utah film. Uh, oh. Uh, it was great in that film. The Jack surfing Keanu one. Reeves, uh, Point Break. Yeah, okay? Point Break. Yeah. great in that. Now, she didn't age well. Um, Madonna, Gina Davis is gorgeous and stuff like that. I, I love I, I love what, this, what the film meant because there was a time when all these guys are off to war, but I wanted more sexual innuendo. Good film. So, so you're saying if you if you were cast as Jimmy in real life, uh, their League of Their Own two would have had half the half the roster of the Rockford Peaches pregnant by that time. Yeah, by, by, by the second the season, we would have been in the <laughs> now we would have been in the porno league. <laughs> yeah, 
And don't think, hey, pal, you're an esteemed movie critic, but don't think you would have been coaching another team. Come on, man. You're men. We are men. We are men. You know? Men, 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 men. Or men, men, men. Yes. Baseball has a stick. Yeah. It, you know? It is. Stick and balls. And yeah, it, it, it is. I gross on your show, but I am fat fish. And I, I, lo- I like the film. It's not, but it, it's probably, I would have it in my top 15. But uh, I, I, I like that it, it, it showed and it had emotion to it. It showed what these girls go through because some of them, their guys were off to war. And um, I don't remember, was Tom Hanks, did, did he get deferred for it? Or what happened? I, I forgot his character because. No, he was, uh, he was an alcoholic ex-ball player with bad knees. Okay, so, it was, so, he, so basically if he grew up, he would have been Walter Matthau on Bad News Bears. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but with bad with with bad knees, so he, even if he wanted to physically, he couldn't have gone into the service at that point too. That's it. Um, moving on to my number three film, uh, this is one that came out uh, a couple years earlier. Came out in 1988. This is John Cusack. This is a whole host of young actors of their time. This is sort of Young Guns, but baseball in terms of young actors of the late 80s. This is Eight Men Out. This is the story of the 1919 Black Sox scandal. The World Series champion White Sox, or would have current or former World Series team, that basically they threw the World Series because mobsters paid them off to throw the game. This The title refers to eight men from the White Sox team that were banned for life. This is also the reason why the Shoeless Joe character in... Uh, in Field of Dreams, got banned from baseball. This is sort of that story, that original story of Shoeless Joe Jackson and the rest of the White Sox that were bought off, paid off, and kicked out of baseball for the integrity of the game for throwing the World Series. And this is back when the World Series was... The World Series is still big, but back then, the World Series was bigger than football, bigger than... Basketball hadn't been invented yet, or at least not the NBA. The NBA came along 20 years later. Football would not be in uh, the NFL starts in 1920 so baseball basically the only game in town and this is this is back when everyone's traveling everywhere on train cars so <laughs> we we get we get baseball at its biggest you get you get a huge cast led by John Cusack as Joe uh as as Joe uh in the, you know, the all kind of the the iconic line to the, the the newspaper kid at the very end who's lost his faith, he goes, Say it ain't so, Joe. Say it ain't so. It's the kind of line that could, in if it's delivered poorly, could be really sarcastic and made fun of, but because it's said with such earnestness and such faith and such a broken heart of a kid, dealing with the heartbreak of, of you know, hero, hero worship and all that that goes along with it in a great film. Mm-hmm. Eight Men Out is my number three film. Yeah, you're, you're, Sweeney, DB Sweeney played Chula Show Jackson in that movie, if I if memory correct on that, right? Um, and the what was um, am I am I am I allowed to curse on this or no? Am I going to keep this PG? You already did so, a few times, so I, did. I don't think I did, but I'll say <laughs> what the crap about it was. Chula Show Jackson hit like 468 in that World Series. There's no way he was part of that. And he wasn't a really intelligent guy, believe it or not. You know that. He was not, he didn't know how to read. He wasn't, he wasn't a learned man. There's no way he was part of that. Where they were, yeah. I remember there's a TV show that I loved on HBO called Boardwalk Empire. And part of one of their seasons was Arnold Rothstein was was telling this Steve Buscemi character, I'm involved in this scandal with the wife. It took place in 1919. That uh, I'm involved with the scandal, and Arnold Rossing's a real character, is a real mobster uh, in New York that was involved in that, and they used that. So it really happened. It's scary, you know. We've gone through that with the NBA 20 years ago, and but Shoeless Joe Jackson, and I, they did address it. I don't think he was. What do you think? I, I don't think he was involved in it. Uh, you know, I I don't know. It, you know, when when you when you talk about very few people have hit 400 for the, for a season in, in the history of Major League Baseball. The fact that he was able to, granted over a shorter time span, hit 400 in the World Series of all things, it, if, if he was throwing the game, he was all he was making up for it stats wise other other places. Right. I mean, I, you'd have to really go do a deep dive in terms of box scores and 
Right. And, uh, and to really, I think, truly get a real sense of whether or not he, he did or did not. But if, if, he, if he did, then he was, making, he was sure as heck making a case for himself before, <laughs> before right. people find out that, that they threw the World Series. So, and you're right, John Cusack plays Buck Weaver. Um, Clifton James plays the, the owner, the, the greedy owner, Charles Kaminsky of Kaminsky Park fame. Um, interesting, too, the rest of this cast. You have Gordon Clapp, who's one of the big actors from NYPD Blue. You've got John Mahoney, who was the, the dad in Frasier. He was also in uh, a, a couple of different uh, 80s uh, Cameron Crowe films. Michael Rooker, player playing Chick Gandell. Uh, David Strathairn, in, in one of my favorite roles of his, is Eddie Chicot, uh the left-handed pitcher. So he was uh, there. And also, Charlie Sheen, in another baseball movie, playing Hap Flesh. Or Hap Felsch. i got to say that. Hap, Hap Felsch. And you're right, D.B. Sweeney as Shoeless Joe Jackson. This is also a film written and directed by Elliot Asinoff and John Sayles, and directed by John Sayles. So. Yeah, I think this is this is a film that is largely forgotten. I think by a lot of people. Like even if you look up um, on Amazon, I've tried to buy this movie a couple of times on Amazon, and my rule of thumb is never pay more than ten dollars for a Blu-ray. And this is a film that's been released on Blu-ray, but Eight Man Out did not get a wide release on Blu-ray, and it's like thirty dollars every time I look it up. So. I have not yet added Eight Men Out to my Blu-ray collection, although I'm always looking to see if it goes on a uh, flash sale or something. But uh, this is one that has, I think, largely been forgotten. And even in the pantheon of baseball movies, it's you know it's a baseball movie, but it's it's a movie about scandal. So I think that's probably why it doesn't it doesn't evoke a lot of the feels that people want to get out of a baseball film. So true story. Yeah, true story. And and really well done too. It almost kind of almost kind of sort of feels like a documentary, um, not not documentary style, but it does it does have that the feeling of weight of 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 being a real story being told. And it feels like we're getting a realistic version of that story. Um, it's it, it's not. It doesn't make the players look overly romanticized. It doesn't make the players like oh look at what they got forced into. No, this is this is something that. Uh, there's a lot of peer pressure in seeing the dynamics of a team, of a team, the inner dynamics of a team, and also, um, you know, before players were millionaires, how do you put food on the table? So this is a lot of the financial pressures that player the players were under, even in back then, back when baseball was king, back when it was bigger than it is today, uh, but without all the money that there is today. So yeah, eight minute I think is has been forced from the public limelight, but uh, still a great film and then just just to catch us up we're going to go uh with my number two film uh major league 1989 charlie sheen another baseball movie from charlie sheen but one of the all-time great baseball comedies that's that's this that's all this is this is a good time it is an all-star cast it is carver bernson it is it is wesley snipes before he was wesley snipes and he was willie mays hayes this is the stripper who inherits the team, and the and the team rallies together to give her a giant middle finger with a naked picture of her as a showgirl, and they remove a single piece of clothing or a single piece of her piece of clothing from this big cardboard cutout every time they win a game. And by the end, of course, the big cardboard cutout is basically completely you know, naked in a PG thirteen sense. Uh, this is, this is James Gammon, one of the great, you know, the, the great hacked voice, kind of a grizzly, uh, I can't even do his voice without, like, trying to lose my voice. One of the great baritone voiced actors of his era, sadly gone before his time, but a great performance as Lou, the manager, the guy who's, who's trying to flip off the owner who everyone is able to rally around against the owner. It is the working man. It is sort of the bad news bears, but Major League Baseball. It is the people that shouldn't be there that they purposely invite because they because they think they're bad baseball players and they want to not be accused of moving the team. All of that, they still come together. They still make a run. 
all of that and, and all the great comedy too. I mean, and I love, I love the um, the credit card commercial they do in there, the American Express commercial. They're still doing those American Express commercials like that nowadays. A great case of product placement in movies, but it's a funny scene. Yes, it's product placement, but that's part of the, the fun of that scene in that film, and it's it's one that still it's a, it's a it's still in commercials today. So all of that, Major League, my number two film. Uh, more thoughts on Major League? You already have on yeah. your list. One of, one of the we we talk about in the bar business, which I'm in. We talk about this one scene. So there's a scene where Corbin Burnson's wife is watching these guys celebrating a win, and he's making out with some girl in the background, well, in, in the locker room. So she knew that Charlie Sheen had a contentious relationship with, with Corbin Burnson. She wa- and he's in a bar drinking, and she walks up to Charlie Sheen, and she stands behind him. This is Corbin Burnson's wife, played by his name is Dorn, and she says to Charlie Sheen, I, I, I don't know for a but it's sort of like, you're the sexiest, most handsome, beautiful man I've ever seen in my life. He looks at the bartender and goes, check. <laughs> so Dorn finds out that Charlie Sheen, you know, has an affair with his wife. And it, it, it's another little, you know, spoiler, but it was just great. It's great. Great dialogue in the film. It's interesting, you know, Sheen talked about what a great relationship and friendship he had with Tom Berenger. And I just thought about this. I forgot that they were in Platoon together two years yeah. earlier. That film came out in what, 88? When, when did this Platoon came out in 88 or 89 Platoon came out in 86. Yeah. So they, they had a working relationship and they were, they were rivals in that big time. And, um, you know, I, I, everything about major league, you hit it the nail on the head dragon movie guy. It's a great comedy formulaic, but it worked because it was dialogue and you ended up rooting for these guys. And I just thought it was great watching the making of it on a VH1 special. And all these guys had to go through six weeks of training, except we talked about, it. we talked about, Corbin Burnson had some baseball in him, and Charlie Sheen, you know, if he would have stayed with it, who knows? He might not have been three men. What was the show we did? What's the sitcom? Two and a half men. Two and a half men. I have half his shirts, you know. <laughs> well, yeah. and, you know, it's funny. You bring up the, uh, you, you bring up uh, Ricky Wild thing, Vaughn, in inadvertently sleeping with Doran's wife. I, I love the, the payoff of that scene at the very end of the film where they come together, they win the big game. There's all that tension between Dorn and Vaughn throughout the entire rest of the film. And while they're celebrating, Dorn comes up to Vaughn, punches him in the face, <laughs> and then gives him a hug. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a minor subplot, but the tension is there the entire film. But it's just the comedic timing of resolving that tension and yet celebrating and getting even at the same time. Without much dialogue, because it's the middle of they're they're celebrating, it's screaming. So the fact that they do all of that payoff, that comedic payoff and dramatic payoff too, without even really saying much, other than with a punch and with a hug. <laughs> well, yeah, he knew, it, but it says without... everything about the the filmmaking that they do in Major League. It, it's 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 a that's, it's a reason why it's number two on my list. It's, it's up I have one more thought that makes it number two. We talked about Gina Davis. Obviously, we have her. She's in a league of their own. You talk about Susan Sarandon. We did the symmetry of Thelma and Louise when bring Susan Sarandon back into Bull Durham. Renee Russo was so hot in, in, in Major League, and that's Tom Berenger's love interest. And she was hot in the Lethal Weapons, and I don't know what she's doing nowadays, but talk about the women back then in the 80s that were the hot, you know, the, the, the starlets. And then you, you talked about Madonna starting out her career and, and – there's a whole generation of these ladies that were so beautiful back then that you and I could appreciate. Now it's the new ones. Now it's the, uh, I would love to see a remake of major league and, or a league of their own. And every, you know how I feel about Sidney Sweeney, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sidney yeah. Sweeney could play all the roles, you know? So Sidney Sweeney and, and um, you know, uh, Selena Gomez and they they should all be the new ones in the new baseball movies. Who's the girl that plays Wednesday that's hot right now? Oh, uh, Jenna Ortega. Beautiful. Yeah, these these are these are the new Renee Russo's, Susan Sarandon's, Gina Davis's, and Madonna. I I I say to Hollywood, and you have a you have a finger on Hollywood, Dragon Movie Guy. We need to do remakes of these films and cast those women. Well, they 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 kind of did not not those actresses, but they did do a League of Their Own streaming show on Hulu um, last year, so. I did not see it, but they did do a remake um, of A League of Their Own recently um, nice. as a streaming show, but not uh, not nice. not A-list talent, uh, for sure. 
Uh, other interesting note on Rene Russo. This is one one of, I'm not saying it's the first, but it is one of her first acting roles after being a, a big-time Ford model throughout most of the 80s. This is, this is her making the transition from modeling into acting. And, you know, sit, lots, of, lots of former actors, former models have tried to become actresses. Most of them don't have the kind of career that Rene Russo would eventually go on to have go on having um but her role yeah as the romantic interest in this film she's playing an ex olympic swimmer and she actually has for being not a great for being not a big part she has a great and key role that really does motivate tom berenger throughout the entire film as also the kind of the, the broken down soon to be former major league catcher She's the romantic interest in there that still motivates him, even though she is retired. Also, he's not chasing around these young girl, these young women. He's chasing around his former lover, who's moved on with her life, and she has a huge impact in a relatively small role in one of her first acting, first major acting roles, at least. And it, it is interesting to note too. She comes from a highly successful family because it's Rene Russo, as in the very successful directors of the last two Avengers movies, the Russo brothers. Right. Well, the Russo brothers have a Russo sister and that's Rene Russo. That's so I did not know that great, the, great the talent and the success and the hard work that it takes to be a success in Hollywood runs in the Russo family. So yeah, you're right. I Rene Russo more, is great. in his film. One more, one more dragon movie guy. I'm looking at my list and I'm thinking of, uh, of the leading men that I have on my list. And I'm looking at Costner. Behringer, the all American guys, okay, Costner uh, in two of the films. I have Behringer, okay, uh, uh, a leading guy. And then you, you brought up Robert De Niro, got his, I mean, these, these he, I, I'm shocked. I don't know, you know better. I'm shocked that Clint Eastwood never did a baseball movie. Because I think about oh. the, 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 the men of Americana, the leading guys back then. Clint, Clint could have done a baseball movie in the 70s and got away with it. That's just, just my out of nowhere type of, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, he was, Clint came up in an era where he was, I forget what Western it was, but he was, was the starring character on a 60s Western um, before going into film. So he he might have been too old to play a, a young baseball player in the 70s. He would have been like the Crash Davis type character sure. in the 70s by the time he's a, he, by the, because he does, he does the spaghetti Westerns in the late 60s oh. with Sergio Leone. So yeah, I don't know if he would have been too old um, at that point to play baseball player. But I'm sure they 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 all they do all kinds of uh, age reduction in Hollywood. Um, so sure. he, he he probably he's 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 well into his nineties now. He's still alive. He's still working. He, he it's Clint Eastwood. He could play a baseball player now, and, and probably sell it with CGI running around the bases and. and uh, and like you know, he's and, and of course it'd be Clint, so he'd be smoking a cigar in the dugout as Clint at his age, uh, <laughs> still somehow playing a baseball player. He, he can do it, but you're right though. I yeah, Clint uh, Clint Eastwood never played a baseball player, at least as far as I can remember. So. Nope. That one of the that would be that would be one of the great things to see because in in an alternate reality, is that movie one of the worst films of the seventies or one of the best films of the seventies? Because I could totally see that being an awful film that we go, hey, remember the Clint Eastwood movie that he did back in 1974? Ha ha ha. Or it could be like the baseball film, the baseball movie that gets that gets him an Oscar nomination decades before uh, yeah. earning one in uh, in the uh, oh, crap the the western from 1991 that he was uh, won for best director. Um, Unforgiven, phenomenal for, film. Yes, Unforgiven, great film. Uh, moving on to your number one. Before we talk about your number one, uh, just talk about uh, you, you know your your list. This is your number one. Um, great film. It didn't make my list, but it is a great one, and has the late Chadwick Boseman as an all time great baseball player. What are your thoughts on Forty Two? It, it was the most riveting. True story about Jackie Robinson. But the way they shot the film about his life, and there's a scene in there where, the, where back then the managers used to coach third base. And the, and the guy that coached third base is a, I, God, 
I can't. I, if you go to the IDBM, then I should have had a better research on it. He's an English actor that's in an alien show on TV. He's in everything. He was in Death at a Funeral, the, 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 the English version. But he plays the Philadelphia Phillies manager who managed one season. And he's standing at third base. And every time Jackie Robinson in the movie gets up to the plate, he's shouting the N-word, right? Mm. And you see the tension in Jackie Robinson, and he can't shake it off. And finally, in the third game of the series, P.B. Reese gets out of the dugout and walks up to the guy and says, if you continue to use that, I'm going to beat the shit out of you in front of everyone here. And at the end of the film, they said that that he was never managed again. But it showed you what J Jackie Robinson had to go through. And it showed you what a brilliant man, Branch Rickey, who was played by Harrison Ford, by the way, um, was to take this risk on a guy and and, and bring a guy into, into the league. And I always think this. Just think of these poor guys. Think of the Satchel Pages and the Josh Gibsons. Could have played Major League Baseball in the 30s and 40s. Think about the records they would have set that they hit. Josh Gibson had 866 home runs. You know, if you took the best players in the, I'm getting off the tangent at 42. If you took the best players in the Negro League and put them on one team, no one beats them. No one beats them. The Yankees wouldn't beat them, the 27 Yankees. That being said, Chadwick Boseman is, is, is an American icon as far as a, an artist. I mean, he it, talk about a guy who was taken way too soon. The fact that he did Black Panther and no one knew that he had pancreatic cancer, you know that story. But playing, Jackie Robinson, he said in one of his interviews, was one of the highlights of his career because you get to play someone that broke a barrier in America's pastime. But what this guy had to go through. And just that scene when you watch that manager screaming at him, the N-word constantly, I had a hard time. I saw that in the theater. I had a hard time watching it. I squirmed in my seat. I squirm anyways. I'm a, you know, I'm a jumpy guy. And brilliant film. Brilliant film. I, I, I uh Dragon movie guy has to see this film within the next week. Oh no, I, I've seen this film. It's it's a it's a good film. It didn't quite make my list because the the, the the all the films at the top of my list are kind of more time and place kind of thing. The, the, right. This is a good film, a great film. Um, it is interesting too. Harrison Ford. You talk about uh, uh, actors attracting other actors to be in smaller parts in a film. Christopher Maloney is Leo DeRosher. DeRosher. Alan Tudyk is Ben Chapman. Lucas That's Black, uh, Lucas ba Black is Pee -wee, Pee Wee Reese. John C. McGinley, uh, the the Doctor Cox from uh, from Scrubs. It, you look all the way up and down this IMDb page. It it's players or it's it's actors that you've seen before playing players that you've never heard of before. Even T. R. Knight from uh, Grey's Anatomy is playing second or third or fourth billing here. Second building listed here as Harold Parrott. Um, talented cast: Nicole Nicole Berry as Rachel Robinson. Yeah, great, uh, great actors in a great film. Um, it, it's uh, it's it's interesting too. The fact that this happens in 1947 in real life that Jackie Robinson breaks the character the color bar barrier in 1947. It it just goes to show how long African American baseball players were held down because very quickly in the early fifties, early mid fifties, Willie Mays comes along, Hank Aaron comes along, and are able to play their entire careers, or at least the vast majority of their careers, in Major League Baseball and are at the very top of Major League Baseball's record books as a result of what Jackie Robinson did five years earlier. The fact that he paves the way so that and you know, and Jackie Robinson is what, 26, 27 when he's a rookie, so he has a 10-year major league career, but not all-time list kind of stats-wise. Very soon after he comes up, Willie Mays, Hank Aaron, and so many other great Hall of Fame players come along, having full careers based off of what he, the weight that he had on his shoulders. So yeah, it's what Jackie Robinson had to do. There's a reason why every April 15th is now Jackie Robinson Day, and every franchise has number 42 retired. That is for a reason. That is so people don't forget what what uh, what all players had to go through. And the film having Chadwick Boseman play Jackie Robinson is, uh, you, you, I, you know, if if casting is 90 percent of everything, 
the fact that they were able to cast Chadwick Boseman at such a young age to play Jackie Robinson, the fact that the directors were able to see the gravitas and the acting ability that he had, um, Brian Helgeland, never heard of him before, writer-director of this film, the fact that he was able to see that in Jackie Robin, in Chadwick Boseman to be able to play Jackie Robinson um, is phenomenal in terms of casting, too. So, yeah, great, great film across the board. And your number one film, I might add, too. Going over to my number one film to finish off the list, my number one film is... Field of Dreams, we already talked about it. It is on your list. It is my number one film for every reason that was already stated, but also it is that time and place for me. 1989, I'm 14 years old. This is also the year as a kid from Seattle who's 14 in 1989, the year that Ken Griffey Jr. comes up, comes up and he only had like 24, 25 home runs. But if Michael Jordan, the Michael Jordan Air Jordan logo is Jordan dunking, Ken Griffey Jr.'s swing, his all-time iconic swing, there's a reason why the, the swing of Ken Griffey Jr. is Ken Griffey Jr.'s logo. All of that's kind of happening at the same time for me. I was not a good baseball player as a kid. Um, I have, I, this is not a complaint at all. I have 20-20 vision to this day, so I am completely happy with my vision. But I have very poor depth perception. And you have to be, you have to have good depth perception to be a good baseball player, to be able to hit and throw a tiny ball and hit a round ball with a round surface with a baseball bat. So I was not a good baseball player as a kid, but I have always loved baseball as a fan. And all of that kind of comes together for me, uh, being able to watch, uh, being able to watch Field of Dreams with my dad and my mom and my sister. Um, in theaters in 1989, seeing this all-time Kevin Costner classic, James Earl Jones, the whole weird, the the the, the, the idea of a farmer going plowing under his crops and then going on a road trip to go get Darth Vader, uh, <laughs> it's a weird thing. Seeing a young Ray Liotta, pre-cocaine Ray Liotta, playing a guy, you know. Seeing him play Sho- Shoeless Joe, another you know kind of a flawed character, great casting, top to bottom. It's also you know time and place for me where you know for me in my life, the uh, the emotions that I have for Field of Dreams. It it's one of those films that I'm glad they never did a sequel to. Although I'm sure it probably was one of those things that Kevin Costner held in his back pocket in case his career went went down the tubes. He could probably do a Field of Dreams sequel at some point. Thankfully, he never did, and he, he's never had to. But uh, yeah, all of those, all of those reasons, time and place, as well as the quality of the film, and even that last last shot of the film, where they have all of the you know the people will come right. The, the payoff to that speech is a thing they did on film, not digital in real life. They actually have the real life farm where they in Iowa where they built the actual the farms. There's two of them where they built the baseball field. They actually have a helicopter shot at the Magic Hour, which lasts for... They, they only had three takes of this. And they had a local radio station run a contest that says, hey, you want to be in a Kevin Costner movie? Come over here at this date and this time. So they really did have thousands of cars in real life lined up on those county roads. And what they found out was that because they only had 15 minutes to get a couple of takes, and this is this is a helicopter shot too, so they have to get the co- coordinate a helicopter taking off, to get the shot of all of those cars coming to the the Kinsella farm, they figured out that the cars have to remain stationary, and to fake the movement of the cars driving, they had the the, uh, the people in their cars, the real-life people in their real-life cars, just flash their lights to fake what they were moving. So, all of that, that iconic last shot, paying off the James Earl Jones speech, that brilliant filmmaking, um, all of that is why it's number one on my list. Any uh, any other thoughts on on uh, Field of Dreams? No, I, I, you, we we hit it all. We hit the nail on the head. I, I, again, it's one of those films like I'll, if it comes on before I make take my nap to go to work, I'll watch it. You know, these films that we talked about in our top nine, 
if young people saw it, 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 it would bring a, it would bring a little bit of a, an electricity in your system for baseball. Um, it, a lot of these films that I have are period pieces and baseball was better in America in the twenties, thirties, forties, fifties, sixties, and seventies and early eighties. And now because of my, my last addendum to this whole thing, because of cell phones and TikTok and everything like that, we're losing the 18 to 45 demographic through studies. And if you lose that, how does baseball build? You said it to me. We had a, you know, we're, we're in a bar one night, you and I, and you said to me, Hey, you, baseball's not available because it's, it's, it, you, you can't watch it. It's too expensive to go to and you can't watch it. Well, you know, make it available and make it so people can watch it. And then maybe some of these films that have more, uh, um, you know, allure. And uh, speaking of these films, um, I have your your list up, your top nine list. Um, reflect a little bit on your list. Um, are there any um, are there any of these of these films that you would put higher or lower on your list? I mean, all the way from Bull, Bull Durham at number nine, The Natural at number eight, Sandlot on on up. Um, are are you happy with your ranking? Would you change it now, or or uh, now that we've talked about it, or? or uh, so let's talk about your list on, in reflection. I, I, I'm happy with the ranking. I have both, I have banged the drum slowly number four, all because of the, the film is that in, it, it's it's that compelling. You know, it it's the bit of all my uh, top nine. It's the most compelling relationship between two players that are totally opposite backgrounds and how baseball brings them together. And it's the language they can speak together when one's going through a horrendous health crisis and one lives life like Mickey Mantle and. Charlie Sheen in in Major League, just you know, having fun and partying and what have you. So, um, no, I would leave it the way it is. I mean, I, I think the Jackie Robinson forty two should be number one because of what that breaking the color barrier meant to baseball. I don't want to get political on this because the film it means so much for people to see that to know that it took. You said it perfectly, uh, Dragon Movie Guy, nineteen forty seven. I mean, God, it, it's it's a while back, but it's. Too long. Should have happened earlier. You know, so that's it. No, I'm good with my nine. And um, looking at my list, um, what what did you think of my list? As, as, I, as I look at it, you know, mine was the, the Sandlot at number nine and, uh, you know, Moneyball, The Natural, all the way up. And what were your thoughts on my list? Did, or- I liked it all. Le- 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 a League of Your Own was maybe something I would, you know, I would have, you know, I, I, good movie. They're all good movies. Moneyball. When you said Moneyball, I could have easily had that in my nine, because again, not only was it a, a great film, the writing and the dialogue, but when you learn something from a film, all right. So Field of Dreams is a fantasy, and Major League is that formulated comedy. But what Moneyball did on a true story was show you something that happened. And now, you know, real real quick on on, on the um, on the Moneyball thing, what they never talked about in that film that pissed the crap out of me is. The reason why the A's had a great season is because they had Tom Glavin and Barry Zito as their pitchers, and they never brought that up. They had a rookie of the year. Remember that? Their pitchers were great. They never brought it up, which I thought took away from the film because it, it, you, you made it seem like there were a bunch of nobodies, that David Justice was ended his career, you're being Mark Haddenberg. But it brought analytics into the game, and analytics are so big in sports right now. You know, yeah. you and I make fun of good morning football. We watch it together, but the person on it that, that's the most – Cynthia Freeland is anal- she's a person has a job because of analytics. Yeah. And I'm watching um or I watch the Major League Baseball Network now. You have guys on that network that are just all analytics. Just started it. Well, and I, I think I think Good Morning Football wouldn't be a failing show if Cynthia Freeland was on that show. Uh, <laughs> if she was if she was if if they uh if they were smart enough to put her on air and she's that smart and she's that pretty, the fact that they haven't put her on Good Morning Football, I think is the reason why that show is failing. Uh, well, when we do the remake of Major League Base, Major League, and you and I could produce it, she could be the love interest of the Tom Berenger character. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> she's about that age. Yeah, <laughs> 30, thirty-five. But that's another story, another time. No, I have, you know, I have a, a a big place in my heart for baseball. I played it. My dad played it. It brought us together as a family. Um, I'm concerned the direction that it's going. It doesn't mean that cinema hasn't has not done it great justice. It has. I think you'll agree on it. And of all the major sports, and I, I was thinking when you did this, if we did a top nine of football, and football is my favorite sport, you know that, I'd have a problem. Basketball too, and hockey. Forget it. You know, I mean, I, it, it's I love hockey too. I love all the sports, 
But baseball has is the reason why we're doing this is because baseball does have like a hundred films and to do a top nine is tough. Well, and it's interesting too. Like if you going through the list of baseball movies, if you look at the, the IMDb baseball movie page, it's hundreds of movies over decades, but there's not nearly as many big baseball movies over the last 10 years talking a little bit about baseball struggles. The point. There, there's a reason why Hollywood isn't spending tens of millions of dollars to make baseball movies very often anymore. And when we when they do make them, they're they're usually lower budget, straight to streaming. You don't know the actors as well going in. So, uh, yeah, I think that that I think that the lack of the lack of ba- recent baseball movies on our list kind of reflects the the dwindling interest in the sport and Hollywood's lack of recognizing that and not putting tens of millions of dollars or a hundred million dollars into a film uh, that it would take to, to properly produce a film of these quality. Uh, Can I say one last thing? Yeah. Get me? yeah. Yeah. You know, movies like the back of your hand, your guru. I said it before earlier in the podcast. Um, there's a film that came out and there's just one scene and the film can't think of it. It's when, and you'll give me, you'll know it in a second. It's with Ryan Reynolds. And he goes 30 years to his past to try and, and Mark Ruffalo plays his dad. And he, and he himself as a younger person find his dad to help. Oh, stop. Uh, the Adam project, the Adam project. There's a scene where they're all throwing a baseball and they said, you remember how much we love this sport? There's a 10 minute scene about baseball, yeah. you know, at the end of the film. So baseball may not be, it may not, my point being is it might not be films about baseball, but there's baseball and movies that have a poignant part of the film. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and now that you bring up, I, I forgot about that scene, but yeah, that, that is a good scene. I, I remember Calling that. back to that in yeah. in, uh, in the, the, the met, Adam Project. But yeah. Ruffalo says, you remember when we like to do this? And you see, you see uh, Reynolds as an older guy, and he's looking at himself as a younger guy, you know? And they're throwing the ball together, the three of them, in a, in a thing. And it just, it's, it's uh, you know, it's emotional. And it, it is. And you, you said, if I take anything out of this, and it's, and it's been a great time chopping up with you about this. It's James Earl Jones's line. And James, of all the films, Field of Dreams is the greatest line about baseball, that it marks a time and remembers when things were good and will be again. And I hope it does. I hope I hope baseball, um, Harry Long, a uh, 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 great football player for the Raiders, said something uh, recently about 10 years ago. And it's true, but it bothers me. He goes, baseball is America's pastime dragon movie guy, but football's America's passion. It used to be baseball was both. You agree with that? Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's uh, George Carlin had a fair, very famous uh, wow. comedy routine called Football versus Baseball. Sure. And not, not to redo the entire thing, but his whole thing was baseball's played in a park where you go home to feel safe. Football's played on a gridiron where you where the, the field general leads an aerial assault down the and it's it's just the, the different natures of the two sports, but both of them can make good movies and both of them are loved for different reasons. Part of the reason why I and I love I love baseball. Part of the reason why I love baseball is up until twenty twenty three, there was not a clock in baseball. You go hundred and fifty years in the oldest major what the oldest major league sport in the United States, there's no clock. There's clocks in every other sport, and there isn't a clock in baseball up until 2023. So that that's why I was so diametrically opposed to a clock in baseball. But uh, it just you know it goes to the dip, to the core of the sport. It it's 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 as George Carlin said, it's making out it's making outs so you can go home where you're safe. It is right. it is that feel good. Americana, which is, I guess, a little bit, a little bit jingoistic and patriotic, but um, you know it, it, that part of it too. I think is it's universal. It's it's uh, it's the nature of the sport. It's it's the only sport too where seventy year old managers who are a hundred pounds overweight, a la Don Zimmer, seventy year old men can wear the same uniform as a nineteen year old rookie. Uh, clearly not the same size, but they they wear the same uniform in the dugout mm-hmm. together. They're not, you know, it's you know, 
When's the last time you saw Andy Reid put on a football uniform in that the NFL? Fair. You're not going to see him with a helmet oh, and shoulder hat. I would love to. How about this? Would you love to see Stan Van Gundy in an NBA uniform with that belly? You know? <laughs> in, in something other than a comedic role? <laughs> oh, that'd be great. You know? hey, but but that's, that's, part of what, that's part of what baseball brings to the equation is just that uh, it's, it's the kid in all of us. It's the the eternalness of it it is the you know the the men playing the sport of boys it is it is all of that and and seeing seeing that played out on film seeing a three out you know what what essentially is in real life a three hour game played out in an hour and a half movie trying to capture all of that along with enough outside stuff you know, dramatic wise to keep other people who aren't sports fans interested in films. That's, that's, that's what I want. You know, that's what I love about baseball and it's what I love about movies and baseball movies are kind of that, that great cross section between the two uh, things. I love that. Part. You got it, brother. Thank you for coming on. Um, tell me a little bit about the fat fish podcast. Uh, talk about your co-host, talk about uh, guests you've had and what you have coming up on the fat fish podcast and where people can find it well we're going in the, we're going to well fat fish we, if you want to watch us live it's on youtube db and atv and facebook uh if you want to listen to us we're on spotify apple amazon iheart and stitcher podcast just go to fat fish i just started a podcast we're going to be episode number eight with brad, actor brad grumberg um look him up on IDMB. he just had a recurring role on curb your enthusiasm and we have guests every week. We've had Tony Orlando on. We had the number one bouncer in the world. We had a kid named Frank Olean on Monday who is just hired to open bars. And he is the number one craft and flair bartender on the planet. And he's the guy that the cast of Entourage hires to go on, on yachts. And it's a great time. We chop it up. We chop it about entertainment, about stuff he's done in the business. Uh, I'm a bartender by trade. And we talk about entertainment sports and and the the celebrities that we've dealt with in the business in our business and the ones he's dealt with acting it's a lot of fun and we've had this guy on this guy's been on dragon movie guy's been on one of my podcasts talking chop it up with about the academy award so um it's a lot of fun we're on mondays 10 o'clock pacific nice absolutely and um i will try and put all of those links um in the uh in the description section of this video and um there will also be uh edited versions of this video uh reposted to youtube in the future uh posting those links as well so fish thank you for joining me thank you everyone for watching thank you rob christensen friend of the channel thank you for uh for hanging out in the chat section and i will see everyone later see you next time see everybody